Hello to all my paisans and gumadas. Welcome to episode two of Gangsters and Cigars. We're Welcome. Shirtless Mike, as usual, by my side uh, for another great episode. I'm going to get some laundry out and talk about some upcoming episodes. Before I do that, I want to give a big shout out to Robert Caldwell. Caldwell Cigars, my favorite. Uh, Robert's going to be on our show a couple of weeks down the road. Um, that should be for a great, great interview. He's got a great boutique line of cigars. Uh, he's a great guy, so we look forward to that. I know Mike and I both look forward to that. Uh, episode three, we're going to have a good friend of mine, Pistol Pete from New York City. He'll be in on the couch with us live, talking about his grandfather. And Louis Lepke, who is one of the original hitmen for Murder, Inc. Uh, and some stories about his grandfather and his connections with Murder, Inc. Uh, we're also going to have down the road a very good friend of mine who I served with, who has out some fantastic books. He's got the largest collection of mobster photographs and collections in the U.S. He's got two great books out. Uh, I'm going to try to get Bobby to come on here in another couple of weeks as well. So we have some great guests lined up. Um, I've got a good story for you tonight about me meeting Chuck Zito, uh, the president of the Hells Angels, uh, when I was just a young cop. Uh, it was a funny story. As a matter of fact, I uh, emailed Chuck about it tonight and told him about the story. Uh, he got a big chuckle out of it uh, so we'll go over that and then we're going to speak about Carmine Galante uh, he was also known as Lilo uh, the cigar it translates into from Italian to English as a cigar he actually was murdered with the cigar still lit in his mouth and we're going to pay homage to some of the other mobsters uh, and their cigars I think tonight is what are we featuring tonight as a cigar. We're featuring the H. Upman 1844 Nicaragua by A.J. Fernandez. Um, that's the only H. Upman that we carry here at Smoke Rank 72, so that's that's one of the ones that uh, one of the mobsters, you know, smokes. So, you know, it's the closest we can get, but it will work. You know, Absolutely. Because it's a good cigar regardless. I'm a huge A.J. Fernandez fan in general. So. Correct. So H. Upman, Partagas, Cohiba, naturally all Cuban, uh, was like the top three of the cigars uh, that most of the mobsters smoked. Now, along with uh, the Nobles, which, as I said in episode one, um, we carry I have here. fond memories. I know you told me that you carry them here. Uh, looks like a dry turd. Um, not... I'm scared to smoke one of, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not one of my favorites to be around, but uh, you know what? We may have to break one out in one of the episodes just to say that we did. Oh, we will. And try it. I'll face my fears. So before we light up, I'd like to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, he's a really good friend of mine. He's actually uh, my tattoo artist and my wife's tattoo artist. His name is Byron. He works at King Street Tattoo in Coco Village, right here in beautiful downtown sunny Florida. Uh, so without further ado, Byron. What's going on, brother? Oh, how's it going, guys? Hey, Byron. Thank you for having me. You Thanks too. for coming on, appreciate man. We appreciate it. you coming on and sure. being our official first guest. Uh, it's an honor. Great. <laughs> Thank you, man. We appreciate it. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Uh, how long you've been tattooing, where you tattoo, and then we'll break into some questions. Before we do that, as usual on all episodes, got my glass of vino, salute, remember, one quick, Saturday nights for the wives, but Friday nights always for the culpa. Byron? <laughs> so that. Um, salute. Salute. I'm not even drinking no alcohol, but some of them. There you go. <laughs> well, it's an honor to be here. Um, like uh, Russo mentioned, my name is Byron. I tattoo in Coco Village, 
at a shop called King Street Body Gallery. Um, I've been tattooing professionally for six years, six and a half years. Um, and I've been in Florida roughly around the same time. Um, yeah, what, what would you like to know, my friend? Where are you from originally? Uh, okay, so uh, I was born in Guatemala. Uh, I moved to New Jersey with my family when I was eight. And essentially, I grew up in a little town called Town, New Jersey. Um, completely different from here, <laughs> very small. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you're familiar with the mobster lifestyle being from Jersey. Yeah, Jersey. Yep. Jersey, New York, for sure. Yeah, okay. Atlantic City. All right, I'm going to start firing some questions at you. And then if um, shirtless Mike has any questions, uh, we'll go back and forth and sure. you can bounce back off of us. So my first question is, what is your style? Um, okay. I mean, what I tend to lean more towards would be more of an illustrative style where I have, uh, you know, line variations and uh, I like to put a good amount of detail in my work, um, but it's not subjected to like uh, realism or like traditional per se, you know, so it's like somewhere in like the happy middle. Okay. Tell me the difference between East Coast tattooing and West Coast. All right. Um, so the biggest thing with that is uh, people are usually have a conception that it's like you know a specific type of tattooing only in the West Coast and a specific type right. of tattooing only in the East Coast. In reality, uh, both coasts are heavy on traditional tattooing and uh, black and gray. I guess the biggest difference would be as far as like subject matter. Like West Coast, you have a lot of that Chicano style, which is like finer line, black and gray. Um, and that's more of like you know, like South, South California, and right? All that. And then as you go up, it goes more into the traditional. As far as the East Coast, you have like up north, like New York and all that stuff. Uh, traditional tattooing is a little bit more uh, sought out. Uh, but for example, where I started uh, at a shop in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, we got a lot of uh, black and gray requests too, a lot of uh, religious pieces, uh, crosses, praying hands, Virgin Mary, stuff like that. But uh, when you come down here, you know, more south from the East Coast, and it's you know, you, you don't get as much of uh, of like those two, I guess. It's uh, a little bit more everything. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. I, I, I wouldn't you know, say like, oh, you know, Florida, like for example, Florida. It's oh, Florida is known for this specific style. You know, so and as time goes on, I feel like everything is so exposed like you know it's a little bit easier to get a little bit of everything no matter where you are and then all your walk walk-ins with uh tourism correct <laughs> a, a, a good portion of them yes um but i will say uh as far as like tattooing stuff that i want to do um i've had a, a, a better response down here in florida versus new jersey like when i first started out right like my apprentice days and whatnot um like i said a majority of things was like a lot of religious based pieces here I've had the liberty to kind of expand to do uh, more dark stuff, stuff that, like, you know, that I, I see interest in, and you know I, I feel like people come to me for that more here than they would have up in. Oh, that's Jersey. cool. So that's yeah. So that's and cool. and I know a lot of people like we know each other for a long time, and um, you've done half sleeve on my wife and work on her other arm, and I know she likes to walk in and say to you, Byron, just tell me what you want, here's an idea, and do what you feel. And I feel the same way when I come in with you. I like your take on, I may come in with an idea, but I like to let you, you're the artist, you know? I like you to do that. And uh, the compliments are just amazing. Um, Dawn's work is, is amazing. I love the stuff that you're doing on me. I have a lot of old stuff, but uh, all of the new things that you've been doing are, are amazing. Um, I love coming in. So, what is, what was your weirdest cover-up? Oh, man, okay. Um, see, that's, that's a hard question. I do get that question a lot, weirdest tattoo, weirdest cover, stuff like that, but it's so hard to say because it's like, to whose standards is it weird? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, um, I don't know, I mean... I guess I would probably base it off of experience versus like subject matter. Okay. Um, you know, like interaction with the clients and stuff. Okay. Um, like I had this one particular client back when I worked in Jersey and I did a cover up on her back and, you know, like the whole time, like she was like grunting 
and it's like it, it, it's it, it's very like a provocative run. I don't think that she intended it to be like that, right? You know, the the, the cover up itself was like a Playboy bunny, and it was we did a a colored uh, lotus flower over it, right? And uh, I mean, as far as the cover up goes, it was you know, pretty standard cover up, but it was more of like the interaction where they're like you know uh at the shop that i apprenticed at it was a big open room and there was like four or five of us in that big room so it's like you know everyone was like okay like what's going on you know so as far as like the weirdest thing i guess maybe that one just out of the reaction from the I whole shop we were just like, oh, so while we're on the grunting and uh provocative tattoos so tell me uh the most provocative placement of a tattoo you've done? Oh, okay. Um, I would say probably like the pubic area, like uh, like the female's pubic area. I would say I've done a couple different ones. From uh, this one client got a slice of pizza, and the oh, words like that. and the words "eat me." I, I like that. <laughs> you know, I've gotten uh, uh, this one particular girl got uh, "yes sir" right on that pubic area nice. uh, anywhere from like uh any boner garages anywhere, <laughs> any boner no garages. no boner garages no no i don't know uh, uh roses and, and little uh knives and daggers right but man i don't know i, I feel like the one that stood up the most was the, the slice of pizza that said no i like the slice yeah. of pizza actually it's classic no demon head or yeah. no no everybody I, likes pizza I, yeah right right <laughs> right, right. No, no demon heads. I, I have done um, like not quite like mandala, but like ornamented designs, like jewelry pieces. Not quite jewelry, but similar, more like, like uh, uh, almost like lacy, but like oh, okay. mandala lacy type of uh, a mixture of a design. Yeah, no, no demon heads yet, though. No demon heads. Damn, yeah, not, yeah, we're missing maybe, the boat. Maybe one day. <laughs> I got a question. So, have you done very many face tattoos? Um, I wouldn't say many. I mean, I've done I've done a good amount. Um, I've done anywhere from underneath the to the cheek to the side of the head to the top of the forehead. Um, anything extreme from like this one lady. She was probably like in her late fifties. She got a arrowhead on the side of her head. I don't know why. I didn't really go into too much detail. But then I've done you know. <laughs> Something to her, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> and then I've done something as little as like uh, a freckle. Like a Monroe? Yeah, uh, it wasn't a Monroe, but it was like it was like a freckle. It was like a little higher up. Oh, that's cool. How long did that take? Like, took me longer to set up. <laughs> <laughs> like seconds, yeah, <laughs> seconds. You know, th that's like the piece where you feel like you know you're gonna get something, but then you just chicken out. You just get yeah. the little freckle. You just, you just, you just, you just yeah. get the needle right. in one time. But, I'm good. Believe it or not, uh, it's actually a, a thing that people go and they get freckles tattooed throughout their face, and that's that's become a somewhat popular uh, thing to, to seek out. Actually, I had a client literally last week uh, trying to uh, talking about her next appointment being just that, getting can freckles you do, tattooed. Can you do hair on my head? You can. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've actually yeah, seen we'll, it. We'll, we'll, we'll include the guy uh, mowing the lawn. Right. The no. Side. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Actually, knew a chick who had a. Uh, cartoon of a guy mowing a lawn right near a pubic hair. So yeah, <laughs> there he goes. Yeah, um, knew another chick that had sweet and sour on her breasts and uh, interesting ones, I gather. You know. So have you ever covered up any gang tattoos? Um, I have not personally covered any gang-related tattoos, um, but. Um, my mentor, when I was an apprentice back in Jersey, uh, did uh, a gentleman uh, from the gang uh, MS-13 walked in, and his whole back was covered in like MS-13 like tattoos, right? And he pretty much explained like, hey, like I need this covered up ASAP. Like, I guess like he retired, he retired himself from the gang life. But I mean, as I'm sure you know and witness, you know, a lot of these gangs, there's no retiring. Like, correct. Yeah. So he did it out of, you know, like, hey, I need to hide this. I have a family. I don't want that lifestyle anymore. And he did his whole back in, like, I think three sessions. Wow. But, uh, yeah. It, and and I, I think what caught me off guard is, just, like, he was he was a very petite man. But when you look into his eyes, like, that, that's where you can tell, like, you know, like, like we've talked about, like, seeing like, evil. And, like, absolutely. And, like, and, like, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Windows the soul. And, yeah. And, you know, a very petite guy. Like, you see him from afar. You want to think nothing of it. Like, oh, you know, whatever. But you look into his eyes and you can tell he's done some 
Uh, Byron and I have had some pretty in-depth conversations about <laughs> stuff that I've done and seen, and uh, so when I'm in there with him and Byron's doing uh, his thing, we usually have some pretty in-depth conversations, which are always cool, always interesting. Uh, I think I enjoy more going and just bullshit with them than I do, you know, anything else. It's like, I do anything you want so we can bullshit for a while. So I get five minutes to see you and talk. Uh, so we got a great relationship uh, yeah, that sure. way. Has anybody ever come in and asked you to do a tattoo that you wouldn't do? Um, yes, actually. And, and this particular uh, topic is a little controversial, a little bit of a gray area, uh, more so here in the South, uh, for example, Confederate flag, for example. Right. Uh, I personally don't tattoo it. Um, you know, if you're into whatever, that's that's on you. But I personally have turned down quite a few Confederate flags. And surprisingly, people get annoyed. <laughs> they get like defensive and annoyed. And it's like, sorry, man. You know, like, well, it's, I mean, <laughs> everybody has their limit. That's something that you won't do. Um, I know of some guys that have had uh, Andrew Mima tattooed on them, and uh, I know that there's tattoo artists out here that won't go down that path, and, and it's respectable. I mean, uh, just because somebody walks in and says, This is what I want, and this, you know, I'll spend X amount of money, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it has to go against your morals and standards to right. do it. So, I respect that absolutely. Yeah. Any, and I know it's like when somebody comes in and sits down in your chair or lays down on uh, the uh, massage table for you to tattoo. I know everybody likes to tell you all of their deep dark secrets. Oh yeah, and it's like I guess it would equate to a woman going to get her hair done. And speaking to the hairstylist that they know forever, uh, but I'm sure you've heard some wild ass stories. Oh no, I have for sure, man. For sure, I mean they call it you know they don't call it tattoo therapy for no yeah, reason. Yeah, absolutely, you know, right. Uh, and I think it's something about like being in pain and like, I mean, sure, like the good communication and bonding to an extent helps out, but it's you know having your client being a you know getting tattooed for hours, you're a little bit vulnerable. So they do tend to open up about stuff that at the end of the day, there's days I'm like, why did you tell me that? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, exactly. You know? I didn't need to know that. Yeah, but yeah. Thanks, so, for, uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do my best to uh, sympathize and relate and uh, uh, ultimately to make sure my client is as comfortable as possible. I, you know, throughout the session, I always ensure them like, hey, like, if at any point you need me to stop for whatever reason, reposition anything of that right. nature, like, let me know because, you know, my client being comfortable is my number one priority. Obviously, aside from you know doing the best work that I can possibly do, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, people tell me everything from you know, in home life, you know, like oh my my girlfriend boyfriend's doing this, caught him doing that, or my dad, or found out, you know, oh uh, this one particular person said like the they just found out that their uh, their dad had a completely separate family, and. You know, it's like like things like I don't know. I, I feel like that's not probably something you should just like tell a complete you know stranger. Or even like if you know me some boy, I feel like that might be a little bit. Too well, personal. maybe they feel more comfortable telling a complete stranger. They get more yeah. vulnerable and, than you anything. Know, I, I, I do. I have because they don't they don't have that outside connection. So it's like I have had a lot of clients tell me that they feel that they come to a therapy session when they're coming get tattooed and I can yeah. understand that, you know. So me talking about my ex-wife with you though, that, that's like you go home and shake your fucking head. <laughs> no, <laughs> believe it or not, your stories have not been like the most like, what the fuck? Like, as far as like, you know, why did he tell me that? Right, you exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm so, sure some of them you probably need your own therapy, you know, after the party. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, yeah. Like, I, oh, I absolutely, you know, it's funny because I Jones after a while and I'll start thinking of things to get done to come in and get it done because Just to me it it's relaxing and it's therapy you know and you always hear oh it must have hurt there it must have hurt there. it's like no man it's relax it truly is relaxing you go in you chill for whatever an hour two hours three hours and and bullshit with Byron and get great work done and leave and go oh well shit what, what am I gonna do next it's like I'm running out of real estate you know yeah. Luckily, I still have quite a bit of real estate, you know. I, I mostly got stuff around like that area, you know. Cause yeah. That's so what, I'm shirtless, Mike. So I'm always shirtless. I was gonna so. ask you, shirtless, Mike, but you got a shirt off. Yeah. Well, this is my place of employment. I debated <laughs> about whether to do it or not, but you know, 
that that's my other show. I have my own podcast. That I do from I'm home. here. I'm here as yeah. a cohort to this gentleman here. So, so I'm right thinking on, about. Well, we spoke about doing some more work. So Byron's going to do a cover up on a really bad chest tattoo that I have. Um, not my Cadillac symbol that if you all can see, because Byron did my Cadillac symbol. Um, so he's going to do a cover up on that, but I'm thinking about doing our logo for gangsters and tattoos. Or gangsters and tattoos. <laughs> for gangsters and cigars, I'm thinking about tattoos. Oh, so, the show right speaking of, <laughs> bada-bump, yeah. So I'm thinking about maybe video on that and adding it to the podcast of him doing our symbol. Oh, yeah, yeah. what well, we could do, uh, you know, I have the ability to play videos and all that. Yeah, stuff, cool. Yeah. You know, throughout the thing. You'd so be we, down we for can, that, too? We yeah. Can, we can record your tattoo session. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be you know, cool. Splice, uh, yeah, you know, we'll do... Yeah. Love it or something. Yeah, do so, walking in, showing a shop. We'll be getting a good sponsorship. Me and you got to go in there together. So come with me. We'll do it together. <laughs> Sounds good. Or so that. gang symbols... You know, being tattooed all the way from the Russian mob or being in Russian prison and every tattoo and every symbol means something and tells a journey and a story in their lives. It also, going back, back. So when I was involved with the Cuban criminal element, when they came over, I was very young. I was assigned in Miami, and it was the Murillo boat lift. Cuba opened up all its doors, sent over all of their prisoners, and from their psychological wards, and we were inundated with criminals from Cuba. And they all had different symbolism tattooed on the webbing of their hands that meant what they were in prison for. So tattooing, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're going to have to help me out on history. Sure. So when they, when archaeologists recovered the body of the, it was a male in ice, and I can't remember how many thousands of years old the body was was it not tattooed are you talking about the uh the one with like the uh like the deer the antelope yes the, oh, so it was a female body female and, okay um it wasn't certain but they believe she was a princess of some kind that they recovered the, the body from. yeah that's real interesting so i mean tattooing goes back thousands of years oh, yeah um yeah even the tattoo- vikings nordics even tattooing here in America, uh, people just think that it started off, you know, like, you know, sa- the Sailor Jerry. Oh, Sailor era. Jerry, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> in the 1950s and stuff. But it, no, it's uh, way before that, like uh, Civil War. Absolutely. Era. Civil War era. Uh, I know American were, Indians were prevalent in that too, tattooing yeah. as well. Yeah, there's, there was actually an exhibition in the 1800s in New York uh, for just that, all the Native, Native American uh, tattooing. That See, that's interesting. His, that history fascinates me. I love history. Um, history of tattoos, I think, is amazing. So one of my bucket list is to go to Japan and get tattooed the bamboo tattooing, correct? Uh, I'd love to do it. I understand that they don't know. It's hard to find a tattoo artist in Japan to do somebody who's white. Um, I do know a couple of buddies that served uh in the marines that were over in japan and got it done but uh i'd love to do that i think i told you the story so talking about tattooing uh, my son who plays in a band uh, his band was in japan uh he was partying with an old girl band they were all japanese and he ended up partying all night unbeknownst to him with the Yakuza <laughs> and he said he had a blast and they showed him all of the tattoos and he was like in awe of the work that these guys had and I know you and I had spoken about oh, yeah. Japanese that's, tattooing that's, yeah. and oriental tattooing I love Polynesian tattooing too I've seen you done some Polynesian tattoos as well Polynesian yeah, tattoos are badass they're, yeah they're very very intricate uh, with, with Polynesian stuff I feel like it has to it's um well, see, I haven't actually done exactly like Polynesian style. Right. Uh, 
I've done more Polynesian influence. Oh, okay. So with the Polynesian style, it's a very particular um, theme and design that you have to come up with. Like it has to mean it, it tells a story essentially. It has, has to essentially be a, a specific pattern rather than just coming up with you know swirls and stuff that look like it. So right. for that, it's more of you know it, it tells uh, whether it's like a chapter in your life or whatever. It's essentially telling a tale of what you been through. Do they have any Polynesian tattoos of telling stories about your ex-wives? Because if they do, and you could find that, maybe that, we could do that together. Know. We would have to Google that. <laughs> we would have to Google that. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to word in the evil spirits. No, Jesus <laughs> Christ. No, right? That's that's too funny. So, getting back to tattooing and, and gang tattoos, Besides uh, MS-13 that you spoke about, have you seen any other or been witness to any other gang tattoos being either done by some other artists that you know or? Uh, you know what? Um, if I have, I probably didn't notice, but not to my knowledge, no. No, I mean, despite working uh, where I worked in, uh, in Jersey and Trenton, um, I didn't, I personally didn't see too much of that. Interesting. Not, yeah. That's cool. I you know I know a lot of people come, especially uh, here in the South. I know a lot of people go in and get certain tattoos, uh, uh, schwa stickers, and the uh, dual lightning bolts, yeah. and and I know a lot of uh, artist friends over the years. Um, he's passed, but a very close friend of mine, Bobby D, who was big in the industry, like you. Uh, he had his limits and parameters, and he wouldn't do swastikas, uh, the double lightning bolt, the um, SS lightning bolts. Yeah. He wouldn't do any of that as well. Uh, so, you know, I understand that. I respect it. I respect um, that that's your thing. And um, moving forward, what's some work that you want to do? Oh man! Um, so I've been wanting to do more dark arts, like style, uh, anything from like demon-like skulls, skulls, anything dark, really. So is that what we're thinking? If you're open to it, I am. So I told you that. you could do. I told you you could <laughs> do whatever. So I told you you could do whatever you want. Yeah. So I'm gonna have Byron do that one first. Come in and I'll show it, um, and then we'll circle back with Byron about getting the symbol done. Hell yeah! And I think it'd be cool to film it over there where he's at, yeah. King Street Tattoo, downtown Cogo Village, Cogo, Florida. Byron, um, another plug. <laughs> Absolute shameless plug. Shameless, shameless plug. plug. There you go. And nothing wrong with shameless plugs on this show. Because we can do whatever the fuck we want. You know why? Because it's our shit. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're gonna get into our. Uh, I couldn't wait. To, I, I couldn't wait to light it up. All right. I, because I knew it, it's it's long enough. It would still be lit by well, the time we get ready to talk. You know me. I just keep talking, so I haven't yeah. had an opportunity to, to light it up. So Byron, I want to thank you for being our first guest. <laughs> thank you, man. That was an honor. I, yes. Uh, you were you. you were awesome. Uh, Flattered um, that you asked me. For sure. I I'm like so stoked about. Uh, us coming in and, and filming you doing some work oh, yeah, and then dope. putting it on the podcast. I think that's going to be cool. Let's do it. Um, without further ado, again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so, for having me. Great you you are you absolutely here. one of my close friends, uh, and sure, I man. thank it, and I appreciate, well. I appreciate you. Yeah, man. So appreciate relax. You. Have a smoke. Yeah. yeah. Um, have I, a drink. I, I gave him a right cigar. <laughs> All right, cool. All three got cigars tonight. And then when we're done, I'll come over and sit down with the MBS. Oh, sounds like a plan. All right, brother. All right. Salute. Yes, Salute. Yeah. Right, I'm going I'm to move, move over just, a bit. I'm going to line up. Yeah, my. Now I don't got to sit so close to you. Oh, uh, I know. We got a little bit of breathing room. A little bit of breathing room. How you doing? <laughs> how you doing? Hey, how you doing? All right, so I'm going to light up mine, and I'm going to hand this over to Shirtless Mike to talk about the cigar. And remember that this is one of the primary cigars, the H. Upman is. 
of our mobster friends. Yep. And again, <coughs> it's not the exact one they smoked. It's what I had available, but it's excellent. So, and again, remember that um, they did primarily smoke Cubans. I think over the next couple of weeks, um, I've got some Cubans coming in. So we'll talk about those as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so All right. You want to talk about this smoke? Yes. Yeah, so I lit this up first because I just I always have a cigar in my mouth in my hand. So this is H. Upman 1844 Nicaragua by A.J. Fernandez. It's a collaboration cigar that he did. And it's excellent. It's it's um to me it's more it's a mild to medium to me. Um it's got nice graham cracker notes I was getting out of it, some nuttiness to it. It has a little bit of sweetness on it. It has yeah, your palate actually tastes some sweetness. I definitely te- uh taste some uh nut almost like a nutmeg type taste to it. Yeah. It is mild to medium. Yeah. To, to, you know, I smoke a lot, so something that may be a full medium to somebody else, it's more of a mild to me. That's why I say mild to medium, because you smoke a lot, that you'll see that your body just gets used to it. It's hard for you to distinguish, unless it's just a powerhouse, but definitely not a powerhouse. It's full of flavor. Um, I'm definitely enjoying it, you know, while enjoying the conversation. Absolutely. Great conversation, by the way. Um, Absolutely. Great cigar. No bite, which... I love. It's just a it's smooth, nice, smooth cigar. And it's been a while since I smoked um, one of these, and we had we, we had two boxes out there, um, and then one of them, and then I had to, I got this size because I sold the rest of the, out of the other box earlier. So I, I was like, let me secure our cigars. So, so, so yeah, I sell them. <laughs> yeah, we have to secure them for every week. Yeah, great taste. I mean, I I really like it. It probably go good with a really nice. Really nice scotch. Um, I think this cigar would go good with anything you want to pair it with. Generally, yeah, you speaking, know me and vino, and it, it's great with vino. Generally speaking, you know, it just goes by the strength level of the cigar to the strength level of the drink. You know, people say, oh, you have to pair certain cigars with certain things. It's all about the strength level of the drink oh, and absolutely. the cigar together. So there are so many combinations that makes it wonderful, you know? So. Speaking of Altman's, let's talk about Carmine Galante. Carmine Galante rose to power in the Bonanno crime family. He was one of the hitmen for Mussolini in Italy. Came to America, got involved with organized crime. Ended up getting whacked at a place called Joe and Mary's Italian Restaurant in Brooklyn. Yep. When he got killed, he was shot several times. Cigar still in his mouth. Yep. Back just like that. He got pictures and all. Still it. Yep. Uh, Carmen Galante was also known as Lilo. Uh, In translation from Italian to English, that means the cigar. He was known as the cigar. There was a lot of other mobsters that had their traditional cigars. Uh, Partagas, Cohiba, H. Upman. But Galante was absolutely known for smoking the H. Upman. We had a fan reach out to me. And the fan wanted to know some questions. Matter of fact, Danny has a, a website. Uh, he's on Facebook. He also has a podcast. He just did an amazing interview with um, one of Gotti's daughters about the old neighborhood. I remember Gotti's house in Howard Beach, New York, um, or Spaghetti Park, which is uh, Regal Park, which is not far from Howard Beach. He did a great interview. Matter of fact, we every once in a while compliment each other. Uh, But he had thrown some questions out. I guess he was testing to see if we knew what we were speaking about as far as mobsters and cigars. I answered the question. Uh, I got a thumbs up and a emoji of a glass of uh, scotch, which Danny, appreciate it, brother. Salute to you, brother. Salute. So getting back to uh, Galante. 
So he was killed in July of 79, I believe, as he was then the Don of the Bonanno crime family. So originally, it was Joey Bananas, Joey Bonanno, who was the head of the crime family. Galante took over. Galante is also credited as being the king of the heroin trade in New York. He, you could call him the father or the grandfather of the heroin trade. That's what he was known as. He had a 14-year-old mentality. He was one of the most ruthless of the mobsters. He'd kill you as soon as look at you. Thus his rise to fame with the Bonanno crime family. And then again, his end came in 1979. So that's our talk on, on Carmine Galante. So that being said, and talking about murders, I want to touch a little bit about serial killers, profiling, some cases I've worked I'm not going to get into so much detail on some of the cases so we can go on on other episodes and just talk about serial killers in general. Yeah. So one serial killer that I like to discuss, and by the way, to this day, he hasn't been caught. So he was murdering prostitutes in Orange County off of OBT, Orange Brassman Trail, for y'all that are not, area. oh, absolutely, for y'all that are not from Florida, not familiar with Orlando or Orange Blossom Trail, uh, it's inundated with prostitution, drugs, and homicides. So he was murdering girls off the trail, and he was dumping them in Lake County, which is a neighboring county, one of the largest counties in the state of Florida. So as a homicide investigator for Lake County, we were investigating these drop sites. I'm not going to call them burial sites. I'll tell you that they were drop sites. Now, a lot of serial killers have what we call signature. So signatures are items left behind, items taken from the scene. So they are collectors. So now when I talk about items taken from the scene, it could be anything from a victim's personal effects or body parts of the victim. I had one serial killer that would cut off the nipples of the female victims and take them with him. That's called a signature. So this particular serial killer that we were looking at who was using a rural area of Lake County. Now, a good portion of Lake County is rural. Built up a lot now, and the day was still rural. So he would set up his victims for shock value. For whoever was going to be the first to come upon them or observe them. And he did it on behalf of law enforcement. He wanted us to see what he was displaying. So the first one we'll call to. Female victim. Naked. She's laying on a mound of dirt. Her legs are spread. And she's looking up. So if you had walked down the path, you would see her looking, sitting up at you, legs spread. Now, inside her vagina was put tree limb, and inside her cavity that was disclosed to us at the ME's office during the autopsy was a full glass Coke bottle. Now, this is his signature. Her finger was pointed to her vagina. So when you were coming up upon her, you looked, automatically seeing her hand pointing to her vagina, her vagina spread, and the damage that was done. 
Now, as the ME does his investigation and his report, he tells us during the autopsy that all of this damage was done prior to death. So his victim was tortured. Items were placed inside her vagina prior to death. The bottle was shoved so far up into her vagina that it was one of the elements of many that had led to her death. She was strangled at the end. That was the cause of death, was strangulation with a ligature. Took the ligature with him because on other victims that we came across, they all had the same ligature mark. So this went on. We found four bodies in the exact same area. Uh, we set up trail cams. We did everything and never caught him. To this day, he's never been caught. Four victims that we know of, Orange County had several more victims that were missing that we think was also a victim of this animal's hideous murders. So when Byron was here and we spoke about looking into absolute evil or knowing that absolute evil exists i can tell you that by no uncertain circumstance evil absolutely exists you don't have to believe in good and evil you don't have to believe in god you don't have to believe in the devil how could you not so i agree with you how can you not believe in two opposing sides regardless of what you believe in regardless if you believe in religion or if you don't i can tell you that evil absolutely exists one of the craziest cases and it's going to take a while to get into so we won't get into it tonight is the case of the gainesville ripper so he killed X amount of students who went to University of Florida along with a police dispatcher, a female police dispatcher. There was a task force that was put together of lead investigators for the state of Florida. I was picked for the task force on this case. Now, what's interesting Watch the movie Scream. I might have a long time. Ago. Okay, horror movie Scream. I'm familiar. Um, it, it's a whole series of movies. Yeah. So the first movie Scream, even though it's loosely based, but they based it on the Gainesville Ripper. And I'll get into his name, and I'll get into the horrific things that he did in another episode because it's probably one of the most interesting of the serial murders to we can, date. We can probably de- dedicate a whole episode to that. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. I'll uh, I'll bring in some pictures. We can upload some stuff. And uh, His name was Rollins. <clears throat> there was an arrest made of somebody who should have never been arrested. The whole case is interesting. Um, a full... A couple, of actually, of full bars by the PD up there. Um, he could have been caught a long time prior, uh, but there were mis- mistakes done. I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm going to go through some of the mistakes, and I'll go through probably one of the crime scenes that hit me and affected me the most. So we'll go over that as well. Just getting back to basically speaking about some serial killers. So one of the most famous mobsters is Sammy the Bull Gravano. Yep. Sammy the Bull was credited with 40 gruesome homicides. 
on behalf of his family who he was working for. Now, let me tell you something bizarre and crazy about the federal government. So Sammy ends up getting arrested, as we all know. Yep. Sammy cuts a deal with the federal government and they overlook 40 homicides. So he would turn evidence on John Gotti. Correct. So the guy who brought John Gotti down gets away with 40 homicides. He later gets arrested with his son, Sammy does, for running dope. Yeah. Running pills. Of all things. Of all things. Not homicide. Yeah. Running pills. By the way, Sammy has a... I just got through watching it today before I came. He's got a podcast out called uh, Bella and the Bull. It's an Italian young girl who interviews uh, Sammy. Yeah. He just did a podcast on what he prepared for and how he prepared to do his hits. Yeah, pretty interesting. But if you talk about serial killers, yeah. you know, he's an absolute serial killer. 40 to be exact. Yep. And again, I can't stress it enough and got away with 40. Yeah. And now he has his own podcast. Own podcast talking about him getting his away with, channel, with murders. You know, he's on Vlad TV with millions of views. So when you Correct. cooperate. Correct. You can Correct. become a YouTube sensation. Now it's not like how he used to Correct. Be. You know, and if I would have done something crooked, the whole time I was a cop, I'd still be in prison. Yeah, you know that's just the way things. It do. absolutely depends on, and we'll talk about targeting and the deals that are made. And so we used to think do a thing when I was assigned to uh, some of the FBI task force, and it was called Queen for a Day. So we bring somebody in who was a target, but not necessarily the target that we wanted. But had ties to the target we wanted. Yeah. And we would say, we're going to give you the queen for the day. You can tell us and divulge and vomit as much information as you want. And we're going to give you the slide. As long as you give us information and cooperate with the target we want. Yeah. And it's, it's just interesting because if you look at what's going on with... Uh, former President Trump right now in the raid on Mar-a-Lago in South Florida. And if you look at the power of the federal government, and the other thing that flaws me, and I know I'm skipping around a lot, it's only because it all has to do with, and it's all going to do full circle when we talk about people who flip on other targets. So we're going to make that thing. For the government now, being that passed that bill, we're going to hire 87,000 IRS agents with arrest powers. Yep. Now, you know they're going to go after guys <laughs> like you and I who... Yeah, they're the average guy. Right. The average uh, blue-collar worker. And their power, like we spoke about in episode one, is frightening. And we're going to do an episode on Operation Greenback which is money laundering, and we'll talk about the powers of the IRS and the government um, as we go down uh, a couple episodes down the road, uh, just because we're getting so many really cool um, guests that are coming out. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Shoot, that first episode, though, man, I tell you what, like, it it exceeded my, I mean, I had to always have high expectations, but... Right. We're at over 200 views for that first episode. So, And I want to thank everybody for yes, thank tuning you. in and, and thanking our fans. Uh, we're getting a lot of fans. I'm getting inboxed by a lot of different people, uh, interesting people, people from all over. Matter of fact, we had uh, inbox from some brothers in Norway, which I thought was very, very cool. They're actually federal cops in Norway. Nice. Um, and they're looking forward to this episode and and future episodes. So, I mean, give me a second to relight my uh, my stoke. Most definitely. No, it was it, that first episode, man. A lot of people, you know, here that come here when I was at work, they was like, man, that was that was really good. You know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, 
what's these two guys gonna do? And I'm like, just trust me on this. You know, this is your baby. I'm the the co-host, the tech guy, and you know, the supporting cast. To, uh, you're the cigar help. guy, man. I mean, I'm just an enjoyer of cigars. Yeah. Uh, but but people, you know, they they they, they got to know. I am a professional at podcasting at this point. You know, my show Hearthstone Live has been taking place for two years, so it's definitely an honor to come alongside Bobby. We've gotten to know him over the year that I've. Um, you know, worked here at Smoke Ring 72. He's a good fucking guy. And well, I salute. appreciate it. Salute for coming appreciate up with it. this idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would love to give a shout out. Uh, a good good friend of mine who I started out in law enforcement when I was 19. So Bobby, who I had mentioned prior, who does and has the largest collection of mob photos and has two amazing books out. I have one of them. Uh, I'd love to do a book signing while he's here, maybe if we can get him in. Uh, Bobby wrote something really, really nice about me that is on our site. Uh, if you guys get a chance and you can look at that, it it really is some justification so you can see that, you know, I am who I am. Uh, I don't pull any punches. Uh, I am that straight shooter guy that uh, Bobby says that I am. So hoping to get him in we could tell some stupid stories together stupid things we've done when we were some young cops but i want to do speaking about cigars i like to give a shout out i'd like to give a shout out to tony nardone uh, at executive cigar so when i started smoking cigars some years back tony took his time with me and taught me about cigars taught me about the different blends taught me about what he thought i would like and I really appreciate that he took the time. He didn't have to do that with me. But over the years, uh, Tony did. Uh, Executive Cigar is another lounge, great lounge. Another close friend of mine, another shout out to Tom Darnell. Uh, Tom Darnell, is a, I'd like to uh, say, is, is a very good friend of mine. Owns an amazing cigar lounge executive as well in downtown Sanford, probably one of the prettiest lounges I've been in. Location is right off the water. It's beautiful. So to Tony and Tom, salute. salute. To Lou here, who is good enough to allow us to record at Smoke Rings. Lou, salute. Salute, brother. He's always been a gentleman to us. Anytime that my club has a function. Lou is absolutely a prince and donates cigars, donates cigars to our cause. Uh, we had our national party here, which was amazing. Yeah. So just a quick shout out to people. I just want to get that out of the way. I, you know, not to have shameless plugs, but these are people who have influenced both Mike well, both of and us. I. Correct. Independently. Before, <laughs> Correct. Before, 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 before we knew each other. So I just wanted to say thank you and a shout out. And again, another big shout out to Robert Caldwell uh, because it is my favorite cigar. He's been a gentleman. Him and I have been communicating back and forth. So again, another shout out to uh, Robert Caldwell. Shout out to my favorite douche, Robert Caldwell. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's definitely an interesting guy. I really like him. The nicest douchebag you'll ever meet. <laughs> All right, well, I'm pretty sure he's going to appreciate that and have a few words for you uh, once he uh, no, no, comes no. on the Every show. Every time I see him, I say the same thing, so it's nothing new. He he knows what's up. It's not it's – not, uh, it's, it's, it's all said in love. Absolutely. Well, that, you know what? That what's anything, makes him any, what he is. Anything that I say on here, I say to anybody. Absolutely. Well, it makes him who he is. So you got to appreciate – have to appreciate that. Most definitely. All right, Robert, I'm waiting for your swag, brother. All right. So we got anything else? Or we Absolutely. Just... I want to tell a quick funny story. If anybody's familiar with Chuck Zito. So Chuck Zito, not only does he play in numerous movies, uh, he was also in Sons of Anarchy. Uh, Chuck was the president. Well, I don't know if he still is, but the president of the uh, Hells Angels out of New York. And the guy is nothing but a gentleman. If you look up some uh, Chuck stories and stuff, the guy is probably one of the coolest fucking guys that I had the opportunity to meet. I met him when I was 20 years old. 
and I believe <laughs> Chuck is like maybe eight years older than me. So I'm a young cop in Daytona Beach, and it's bike week, and I've been a cop a year. So I started when I was 19, I was 20 then. Down the street now, let me backtrack a minute and say that Bike Week in the early 80s and Bike Week today are completely different. Completely different. It was fucking mayhem in the early 80s during Bike Week in Daytona. When Bike Week was predominantly on Main Street, not up in Ormond Beach like it is now. So I'm in a walking beat with my partner. And up the street walks, group of HAs. And Chuck Zito, who I had no clue who he was, walking up the street, he's got on his signature white leather, red, white, and blue fringed jacket. And he's walking with his brothers. And they're walking up the street, and I'm standing there, and I'm standing with my partner, and Chuck turns to me and goes, how the fuck old are you? So I just look at him, and I said, hey, don't let my age fool you on anything. So Chuck starts laughing. I tell him my age. We start bullshitting about martial arts. So Chuck is a sixth dan in the martial arts. I'm a fifth dan in the martial arts. We start talking about martial arts. We start talking about bikes. Uh, I had been riding as a kid. My first bike was a sportster in high school. So we start bullshit. We take a picture together. Chuck goes, I got to go. He turns with his brothers and he's walking away. He stops and he turns to his brother and he said, you know, that kid's got some big balls. Starts laughing and walks away. That story has stuck with me my entire life. And especially when I found out exactly who Chuck was. So it's like every time I see him in a movie or when I used to watch him on Sons of Anarchy, I was like, oh, I met that fucking guy. And he's probably one of the coolest guys I've ever met. My Chuck Zito story. So Chuck is on Instagram. So I hit up Chuck today before I came in. So I relay that story to Chuck and he gets a big giggle out of it. I asked him to come on the show. He hasn't responded. The guy is busy as all can be. Uh, in the day, he was bodyguard to Sylvester Stallone. Um, fought professionally. And now he, I think he's doing a show on custom cars and some other things. So I know Chuck is busy. Chuck, if you catch the episode, brother, we'd love to have you on. I'd love to catch up with you. And maybe laugh and, and get a couple of giggles of me being a kid and not exactly knowing who the hell you were. <laughs> My Chuck Zito story. Absolutely. Man, this has been a great show. Uh, we try to keep it at like an hour because we upload the whole thing, you know, to YouTube and everything. So uh, the response has, has been great. Yeah, and guys, sure. please, guys, girls, paisans, gumadas, if you get an opportunity, please. Make a comment. Leave a comment. If you want me to talk about something, if you want Mike to talk about something, if you want to see a certain cigar, let us know. Drop us a line, and we will. I promise you that we'll respond. Yeah. I promise you we'll respond on air. <coughs> so let us know. Tell us how you feel. Tell us what you want to see. Um, next week's episode, I'm going to have Pistol Pete from New York City on there. He's going to talk about one of the most famous mob hit men and his family's connection. Uh, so next week should be a great episode. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. So what are we featuring next week? What cigar are we featuring next week? What cigar you want to feature? Uh, we've got to keep in the mob thing. You want to do a Cohiba? Yeah, we got the Cohiba Red Dots here, so I can go ahead and All right. do that. So we'll do a Red Dot. And again, uh, this smoke is is the absolutely Robusto, amazing. Are things are pricey, so we'll do the Robusto. We'll do the side. Robusto. <laughs> All right. That'll be the cheaper option, you know. All right. And which is famous, uh, funny, I was going to say, about some of the mobsters and uh, their famous smokes is Capone Smoke Magnums. They were freaking huge. Uh, definitely Cuban. It was Cohiba, definitely out of Cuba, uh, and Partagas. Now, I've smoked a couple of Partagas. I got to say that they're heavy, man. 
the Partagas I've smoked will, will, will knock you on your ass. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to do a Partagas as well. So in close, I know I touched on a lot of things tonight. We're going to do an episode on serial killers. I'm going to talk about <clears throat> how we profile serial killers. We'll talk more about, <coughs> excuse me, hold on. I need some vino. We're going to talk about serial killers, talk about how we profile serial killers. Thank you. Um, and I'll go over some of the cases and some of the infamous cases that I've actually worked. Anything else down the road? Um, maybe we can get in Tony Nardone. Maybe we can get in Tom Darnell. Maybe we could do it from their shop one night. But please, let us know what you want to see. And again... Remember my closing words. You could be at the table or you could be on the menu. God bless. Have a great night. Keep watching. Episode three is going to be absolutely badass. And hit, Mike, the, hit the subscribe button. Hit subscribe, the like button baby. Like, 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 and comment. Good night. Good night. Have a good one, y'all.